The movie begins in a Scandinavian school. 16-year-old Simone is excited about a presentation she and her group of friends are preparing. They joke around and laugh, unaware of the catastrophe approaching them. Suddenly, Simone's father Frederick pulls her away from the group and says that she has to come with him instantly. Frederick is a scientist working for a company called Apollon. He thinks that the world is about to end because of an infectious rainfall that makes people sick and kills them in minutes. The dark clouds are approaching the city, so he puts his family in the car and drives to a safer location. Simone's brother Rasmus refuses to wear his seatbelt, which distracts Frederick and causes him to crash into a vehicle. It stops the traffic and blocks the way. Frederick knows there isn't much time left, so instead of arguing with the other drivers, he brings his family out and runs into the woods. A man notices that they are in a hurry and follows them. A while later, the family reaches a bunker made by Apollon for emergencies like this. Seconds after they get inside, the first drop of rain falls onto a leaf, followed by a heavy rainfall. The family is sanitized by an automated system before going into the living area. The kids are scared, and so are the parents, but they do not show it. Frederick has to go out because he might know a way to stop the spread of the virus. Before leaving, he tells Simone to take care of her brother because he is the answer to stopping all this. Simone doesn't understand him, but Frederick doesn't have time to explain. After he leaves, she goes on her phone and watches her friends die in live streams. Everyone outside is terrified of the fast spreading virus. The mother tries to calm them down by making them hot cocoa, but it is evident that she is just as scared. Suddenly, they hear a banging on the door to the bunker. Their mother knows that Frederick can let himself in, so she asks the kids to ignore it. However, they are too impatient and naive. They rush to the door and open it before their mother can stop them. Outside, the man who saw them earlier in the traffic is standing in the rain. He pulls Rasmus and is visibly struggling because of the virus. The mother leaps at him and asks the kids to close the door instantly. They do not want to leave her outside, but have to reluctantly close the door. She struggles and dies, while Rasmus and Simone cry, mourning her death. Simone takes care of her brother, cheering him up when she can, even though she is hurting too. At night, they go to sleep, but Simone wakes up to a noise. On checking, she finds Rasmus out of his bed. He says that he saw their father, but Simone assumes it was just a dream. Following that, they find the control room and discover that there are more bunkers throughout the city. Simone tries to contact them, but fails. They also get their hands on the radio and attempt to communicate with someone outside. The plan works, and they get to talk to a boy named Philip. He turns out to be a scared teenager stuck inside his basement. He reveals that all of his family is dead and tries to help Simone by calling her father. However, a while later, the connection is lost and the siblings are left alone once again. Simone promises Rasmus that their father will return to them after saving the world. As the two take care of each other, days turn into weeks, weeks into months, and months into years. The scene cuts to six years later. Rasmus has become a 17-year-old teenager. Since he hit puberty, he has been growing more impatient by the day. Simone tries her best to be hopeful, but after so many years of their father's absence, she doesn't know if they will ever get to meet him. Rasmus often blames her for lying when she knew that their father would never return. One night, Simone decides that she has waited long enough. Making sure that Rasmus is asleep, she dons a hazmat suit and opens the door for the first time in six years. If she was going to do something this rash, I wonder what took her so long. Suddenly, the memory of her mother's death comes flooding back. She tries to look for her remains but doesn't find anything. She assumes it must have been eaten by animals and runs towards the city. There are several marks on the ground showing her the way to the quarantine zone. Simone follows them but only finds decayed corpses. It finally hits her that no one is alive in the outside world. The life before the virus is history and staying inside the bunker won't give them anything. Suddenly, a wild dog chases her, and she locks herself in a room. I guess dogs are rainproof. The next morning, Rasmus wakes up and sees her in the kitchen. She tells him that she went outside and saw no one. They decide to leave the bunker once and for all the next day. At night, they cuddle together and fall asleep. 
What they do not realize is that the air duct of the bunker has been blocked and there is no oxygen left inside. Simone passes out, but Rasmus wakes up at the right time and drags her outside. It is then revealed that the blockage of the air ducts wasn't a coincidence. A group of survivors saw Simone yesterday and messed with the bunker's outdoor panel. They gun down the siblings and lock them inside a room. The leader reveals they are there for food, but Rasmus and Simone have eaten almost all of the stock by now. After discovering that nothing Nothing else is left in the bunker for them, they start to leave. If they do, Simone and Rasmus will remain locked inside the room until their deaths. In a desperate attempt to stop them, Simone tells the leader, Martin, that she knows the location of the other bunkers where the food might be available. Martin has to include the brother and sister in his group now that they are an asset. The duo finds out from the group that more than 90% of people in the world are dead, and the remaining are fighting for their lives. They kill and get killed for food, which is the only only form of currency in today's world. A flashback shows us how Martin survived the first rainfall. He was in the military group that was supposed to guard the borders to keep the city quarantined. One day after the rainfall, he was guarding a bridge when a woman with her infant in her arms tried to cross it. He was supposed to shoot her dead, but he could not do it. As a result, she infected his fellow soldiers, and only he survived in the end. Then, he joined forces with another guy named Patrick, and the two started looking for food and shelter. One day, the duo found a group of three. It consisted of their leader, Beatrice, and two of her friends. They promised to show them the way to get more food and joined their gang. However, to stay in the gang, Beatrice provided sexual favors to Martin. Back in the present, the gang is on their way to the second bunker. Although Simone is leading the way, the others do not trust her just yet. Rasmus and Beatrice talk for a while and find out a lot about each other. Even in this situation, Rasmus is just happy to see the sky and the trees after so long. Suddenly, they see a vehicle on the street and hide. Two armed men come out of the vehicle, and Martin is told that they are unknown people who kidnap the survivors. Before they can find the group, a girl running towards the forest catches their attention. When the men are distracted, the group tries to run away, but Simone stops everyone. She wants to save the poor girl who needed their help. Beatrice takes her side, and Martin has to reluctantly oblige, even though it is a stupid plan and a pointless one. A while later, they find the girl in inside a puddle. Even though she was able to lose those men, the puddle water is contaminated, which means she is bound to die from the virus. Martin shoots her dead to end her misery sooner. Rasmus and Simone are shocked, but they try to compromise with the new way of life. They stay at a building for the night, where one of the members named Leia takes a rest because she is ill. Rasmus is made to wear shoes worn by a decaying corpse. He is lucky to have found them, because they are 100% waterproof. At night, Simone falls asleep, but Rasmus has a hard time closing his eyes. He walks around the building and finds Beatrice having sex with Martin. He feels a pang of jealousy because he had started to like her. The following day, they continue towards the second bunker. On the way, Rasmus accidentally steps in water. Martin brings out his gun to kill him, but is stopped by Simone. Fortunately for Rasmus, his waterproof shoes saved him. Why isn't everyone wearing those? Following the incident, they finally reach the bunker, and it is opened using Simone's fingerprint. Inside, they find an entire pantry full of food. The group hasn't seen so much food in years and is overjoyed at the sight. It will be at least two weeks before they start killing each other over this. Right then, Simone notices a phone in one of the rooms. It used to belong to her father, which means he was in this bunker years ago. She finds a video on the phone from Frederick's boss, asking him to come to Apollon headquarters in Sweden. He also says that only Frederick can find a cure for the virus. Simone shows the video to Martin, asking him to accompany the siblings to Sweden. However, since they have security and food in the bunker, Martin refuses, even though there is a possibility of them finding the cure. As a result, Rasmus and Simone leave without the rest of the group. A while later, Beatrice wakes up from her nap and finds out the two left. She wishes Martin farewell and leaves to look for them with Leia and the other member of the group, Jean. Martin and his friend Patrick are left behind in the bunker, which Martin is not happy about. Why doesn't he leave then? The rest of the group meets at the border of the city of Copenhagen and makes their way forward. They enjoy each other's company and are happy to be together. After walking for an hour, they 
they sit down to rest and eat. Jean and Leia go to a nearby eyewear store to get him a new pair of glasses. In their absence, the others are attacked by burglars, looking to rob their food. They run away, but Simone is separated from Beatrice and Rasmus in the process. She ends up in an unknown part of the city, where she meets a little boy. Suddenly, it starts to rain, so they take shelter in a building. When he starts taking random pills for a stomach ache, Simone offers him some food. Suddenly, they are approached by his father, who sees Simone as a threat. She assures him she is not a bad person and offers them more packaged food. When the rainfall stops, the father and son walk outside and are jumped by a group of thugs. Simone wants to help them but knows that it would be foolish, so instead, she says nope and runs away. Somewhere else, Rasmus and Beatrice reach a neighborhood where Beatrice was born. They also happen to take shelter in her childhood home. She hadn't come here since the first rain, so seeing her parents' corpses huddled up on the bed is horrifying to her. Rasmus helps her cope with the situation and chats with her as a distraction. When the rain stops, they go back to the place they separated from the rest of the group earlier. Simone is also there, and the group reunites. But trouble arises when they are yet again attacked by a thug who followed Simone. He holds Rasmus hostage, asking them to hand over the food. Martin and Patrick arrive with guns, just at the right time. They also wanted to be with the rest of the group at the end of the day. Still, the thug manages to stab Rasmus and run away. Simone remembers there is another bunker nearby and begs Martin to bring Rasmus to it. They can use medicines in the bunker to help him. The group selflessly wheels Rasmus to the bunker, but finds it in shambles. They dress his wound to the best of their abilities and save him. In a flashback, we are shown Martin, Beatrice, and their group hunting for food. Beatrice shows him a small house and says that it was her childhood home. It is clear that she lied to both of them and is hiding something from everyone. In the last scene, Martin shows Simone a device they found in the last bunker. The device depicts a map of the city that consists of a wall that was not present before the outbreak. Martin thinks the wall exists because the other side is not affected by the virus. This means they still have a chance to survive. To know what happens to them next, watch the second part in our new channel, Series Recapped.